Great, thank you kindly, Elsie. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. I'm really pleased to uh, uh, be here to talk about convoking the burbs, in which I want to ask, can sustainable community be scaled up for the suburbs? And this might seem like an odd question to ask at a conference about communal life. I mean, really, uh, isn't the classic North American subdivision the opposite of the communal ideal? Isn't the suburb an unintentional community? Isn't suburbia, in other words, the enemy? I think many of us would likely agree with James Howard Kunstler's claim that it, in contrast to an eco-village, our, our modern suburbs are perhaps the greatest misallocation of resources in the history of the world. And there's a, the first kind of uh, commuter suburb in Levittown, New York. And I'm not going to argue against that viewpoint, not entirely, but I do want to complicate it so that we can see the social complexity of suburbia and the urgency of tackling its ecological problems. And I, I want to do so for two main reasons, which are designed to provoke. I think we need to repair suburbia because one, the suburbs actually were born out of a similar utopian impulse as many eco-villages and sustainable communities as an escape from the, the toxic claustrophobia and the lonely crowds of the industrial city. And it, it's time to help them reclaim these original ideals. And two, because I think as we heard at the keynote this morning, the utopian goals of the eco-village network and the communal movement are doomed to fail when faced with the global threat of climate change unless we find a way to connect the wisdom of sustainable communities with the neighborhoods in which the vast majority of the developed world now lives, intentional communities will remain scenic enclaves or self-contained arcs bobbing in a rising tide of resource depletion. Uh, but before we begin, I think we really need to define the nature of the suburbs, to think about the real shape and not their, the kind of media cartoon or caricature. And, and let me confess now, I am a complete child of the suburbs. I, I grew up in what was likely the most middle class neighborhood, the most middle class city, and the most middle class country in the world. Uh, a place that looked not, uh, not a lot different from Leviton, New York, the original commuter suburb. And I assume this was how everybody lived or everybody aspired uh, to live. And as, as permaculture pioneer David Holmgren has noted, by the 1950s and 60s, the suburbs had become the default or even the natural human environment in English-speaking countries, the environment in which most of us were raised and in turn raised our children. And by uh, the year 2000, according to suburb historian Dolores Hayden, more Americans lived in suburbs than in central cities and rural areas combined. And finally, as, as geographer Richard Harris has cautioned, in the United States today, and the same applies to Canada and a lot of other countries, no place seems more familiar than the suburb, but to appreciate the strange particularity of this place, we need to establish some imaginative distance. And, and for me, I only got uh, imaginative distance on my suburban home when at the age of uh, 20, mostly because of a broken heart, uh, I ran away from home to volunteer on a kibbutz. And after eight months on, on Kibbutz Shamir, I returned to Canada. I never, I never joined a commune or founded an eco-village. And yet my time on the Kibbutz uh, opened my eyes to the power of what's known as environmental psychology. How the design of a physical place and a space of, of landscape can shape our emotional states, our social relations, and even ecological consequences. Uh, and back home, when I, when I tell people that uh, well, I, I once lived on a commune in Israel, they often reply, people don't really know, say, oh, you, you went kibitzing, you lived on a kibitz, you, you were a kibitznik. Uh, and there's the, I have to correct them, but there's kind of an accidental truth in the, in the linguistic confusion. Uh, kibitz is Yiddish, and it comes from the rumor, a German root for, that meant being an annoying observer at a card game. Uh, and it, now it's since evolved to refer to idle chit-chat or casual gossip. Or, or shooting the breeze. Kibbutz, of course, comes from the Hebrew for a, a gathering. And it has that sense, I think, of, of being both a noun and a verb. It's a reminder that community is an action and not just an area code. It's a pattern of behavior that a place encourages or discourages. It's an ongoing conversation. To be part of community is to kibitz. And that's what, that's what binds us together. Uh, but kibitzing occurs best on a human scale at a human pace. It is quite literally a pedestrian activity. We walk 
and we talk. I mean, that's, that's what we've kind of learned to do. That's our most fundamental trait as a savanna species, as an upright ape with language. And I think the genius of, of uh, the, the kibbutz, especially in those kind of post-1940s designs that we saw, and most other kibbutz, uh, intentional uh, communities like here at Fintorn, was an architectural design that really promoted kibitzing, that encouraged both walking and talking. Uh, typically, uh, uh, a ring road pushes cars to the periphery. A work district for factories we saw, farm buildings and offices allows residents to walk to their jobs, a retirement home and a daycare, a sports hall, a cultural center, a pub, a library, a general store, bring people together. Everything is centered around that open grassy area that we saw in a dining hall for eating, meetings, public celebrations, an outdoor and an indoor commons. And all of these communal hubs are then linked by a network of sidewalks, like the spokes of a wheel, so that the center should never be more than a 15-minute stroll away. Uh, they created what I like to call uh, the slow foot movement, and this is a picture from Kibbutz uh, Urim uh, in the Negev, which of course is a play on the slow food movement. But food, social life, and sustainability, I think, are intrinsically linked in, in healthy communities. And that's why many of the kibbutzes that have privatized, uh, as, uh, as we saw uh, in the last decade or so, often began by closing their, their dining halls out of austerity. And when they stopped breaking bread together, they, they broke that long-standing social bond. And I think it's why the common kitchen is so vital to eco-villages and co-housing communities and other intentional communities. And it's also part of the reduced ecological footprint of such places. Uh, Charles, and many of you know Charles of Chuck Durrett, the architect and author who helped bring co-housing to North America. And he told me not long ago as we toured an eco-village in Canada, cooking one big pot of spaghetti is more ecological than cooking 30 pots. Eating together also opens up an ethic of sharing in other aspects and elements of communal life too. Uh, he told me he lives in a neighborhood in the States with 34 houses and one lawnmower, which is an unheard of ratio in any North American suburb. And uh, strangely, I was thinking about it, it's also how many Silicon Valley companies from Google to Apple have started to design their corporate campuses to promote the exchange of ideas and the development of innovation. Free food, places to eat together, even bike sharing, open spaces that encourage walking and talking and deeper social connections. Um, ecologically and socially, I think the failure of the traditional suburb is in large part a failure to accommodate our natural urge to kibitz. In the suburbs, we often know more about reality TV stars than our own neighbors. We kibitz over our iPhones rather than the people down our street. And it wasn't meant to be this way. One of the most influential uh, visions of suburban U utopia was the Garden City by British uh, social reformer Ebenezer Howard, which was supposed to be a, a marriage of the best of country life and urban life. Uh, and the Garden City inspired some of the, the designs, or at least some of the thinking, of both the later kibbutz in Israel and the North American suburb. And yet for the same blueprint, the kibbutz and the suburb took very, very different paths. Uh, the developers of the uh, world's first uh, commuter suburb in Levitin, New York, tried to promote kibitzing at first by banning fences, as they do in, in some uh, uh, communities, uh, intentional communities, so that the kids and the parents could roam freely. Uh, that freedom had racist limitations, though, as Levitin only sold to Caucasian families until 1960. Oh, sorry. Uh, the fenceless freedom of the original suburb didn't last. Homeowners demanded privacy and ignored or overturned the bylaws. New subdivisions marketed uh, boxed-in backyards as an actual selling point. Suburbia turned its back on its neighbors, as, as I've heard uh, some kibbutzes are doing as well. And as Dolores Hayden observes in her book, Building Sur uh, Suburbia, unlike every other affluent civilization, Americans have idealized the house and the yard rather than the model neighborhood or the ideal town. Personal privacy trumped social sharing. And this new enclosure movement only emphasized the suburbs' reliance on the automobile. Uh, for me, growing up in the suburbs, the only store we could walk to when I was a kid was actually a car dealership. You couldn't buy anything else on foot except a car to go drive and, and get something else. It was an ironic symbol of how dependent we'd become on the internal combustion engine. And Ebenezer Howard's 
pre-automotive garden city model imagine self-contained communities in a natural surrounding connected like nodes in a network. But zoning laws in the sprawling suburbs and edge cities like Levitan instead disconnected work life from domestic life and domestic life from social life. They turned a village of kibitzers into a bedroom community of commuters, all striving to make mortgage uh, and car payments to drive their kids from one appointment to the next to get ahead or simply keep up with the Joneses. As William uh, Levitt, the founder of Leventon once noted, no man who has a house and a lot can be a communist. He has too much to do. That's an exact quote. <laughs> Uh, in Canada, eco-villages like Yar and Our have been forced to cut through years of red tape and bureaucracy to be allowed to locate agriculture, housing, commerce, education, and wilderness conservation all on one property in a sustainable union. Uh, shared and mixed-use spaces, though, can have powerful social effects, even in suburbia. And here's another uh, quick example. As an adult, when my, my own family moved into a new house, our backyard had a hot tub, uh, but no side fence between the properties. And the natural solution was to keep the tub and, uh, and add a fence. But if, uh, instead, we did the opposite. We got rid of the hot tub, though I'm kind of missing it now, having tried the hot tub here at Findhorn. It's a very social space. And we left the yard open. And a funny thing happened. We got to know our neighbors. My son started to uh, crawl across the property line into the strawberry patch, and our neighbor taught him how to garden and gave him seeds to plant in his own patch. For his first kindergarten show and tell, he brought in the string beans and kale he had learned how to grow. Our neighbor became his friend, our friend, his garden mentor, his shirt tail aunt. And she's as close to him as, as many of his blood relatives, and we are close to her. We drop off our newspaper when we're done with it. She lets us borrow the car, which means, combined with the car share co-op, we haven't owned one in a dozen years. None of this would have happened if that fence had stood between us. A Seattle architect and, and planner, uh, Ross Chapin, described several American communities where homeowners have defensed uh, their, their uh, backyards. They've removed the traditional barriers and returned to an open commons through which neighbors and children can once again flow, can walk and talk. And other communities have done the same with shared back lanes, turning them from car first avenues into communal gathering spots. And Chapin himself has designed many so-called pocket neighborhoods that integrate, like the kibbutz, a central green space and a common building for share meals and gatherings. And he's retooling the conventional suburban blueprint with a vital commons contained in almost every eco-village, kibbutz, co-housing, and intentional community. And I think these green spaces can then be reclaimed for both social use and community gardening. Farming and suburbia often seem at odds given how new subdivisions tend to gobble up productive agricultural land in North America, Israel, and elsewhere. But as David Holmgren has argued, quote, the retrofitting of our existing suburban spaces to make them more agriculturally and economically productive places has always been central to the permaculture agenda. And he urges politicians and policymakers to reduce the legal barriers to suburban homeowners growing and selling food, renting out spare rooms, operating businesses within residential neighborhoods as a way of building genuine social networks, food security, and community resilience, and reducing sprawl, car use, and carbon emissions. Now I want to propose a way to uh, measure the social and sustainable health that looks past the superficial exteriors and ideological differences between un intentional versus unintentional communities, that di a dichotomy of the good eco-village and the bad suburb. And I, I like to call it uh, the kibitz quotient. Uh, and, and it's a measure of how much, or the KQ, how much positive gossip happens while walking a community's streets or stopping in its communal facilities? How connected do we become to a place through walking and talking? So if uh, M equals the meetings per hour and, and uh, with both strangers and neighbors and C, the conversations or even acts of cooperation that result, then K equals MC squared. And that's your community's kibitz quotient, the higher the better. Uh, there are other ways of measuring uh, community connection, some uh, a bit more exact science. Uh, if you go to uh, walkscore.com, it's an online site that will calculate your neighborhood's walkability index via data from Google Maps. It has some flaws, of course, because it relies on digital information that assumes facilities are separated. 
So this is Kibbutz Shamir, where I once lived, and it scores a zero, which is strange, but that's because the algorithm doesn't recognize that many services assumed within a typical kibbutz, a store, a sports club, a car share, a dining hall, all are in uh, Shamir. Fintor, and I typed in Fintor, and I was curious about it, it gets kind of a, a middling uh, score of 40 for the same reason. The program believes you need to drive most places to meet your needs. And I doubt that's true, though I've, I've heard that sort of Finhorn has struggled kind of with uh, how to adjust cars to life. Uh, my neighborhood in, in British Columbia gets a very respectable 88, which is accurate to a point, but only because in a city, social facilities are more easily mapped by Google. But it's, it's a start, and it's, it's an interesting comparison. Another example, I don't have a slide here, is called the Popsicle Index. I don't know if anybody's heard about this, but it's from Catherine Austin Fitz. And the Popsicle Index asks, what percentage of residents in your community believe a child can leave their home, walk to the nearest store to buy a snack, and return safely? Again, it's a subtle gauge of both community trust and walkability. And I'm sure in this case, kibbutzes and eco-villages would likely score high compared with your average suburban neighborhood with its remote facilities and parental concerns about stranger danger. Uh, which brings me back to intentional design. The original kibbutz was obsessed with uh, maintaining its kibbutz quotient, even if it didn't call it that, with every decision and design, to, often to extreme degrees. And I think most infamously in the Battle of the Tea Kettle, in which kibbutzniks worried about pri that private ownership of tea kettles and later radios and TVs would break that social bond that happened when members had to go to the dining room to use a kettle or watch TV together. And I mean, it might seem uh, ridiculous to us now, but they, they had uh, a point, especially if we consider the kettle a kind of metaphor for what sociologist Ray Oldenburg has called a third place. And this is actually a photo taken after our last ICSA conference in, in, in Israel. And he defines a third place as a physical site that's neither work nor home, an in-between place, a gathering place, a place like a coffee shop or a pub, a hair salon or a barber shop, a library or a community center. A place that, as Oldenburg says, serves the human need for communion as a center of informal public life. <coughs> I think ultimately the parable of the tea kettle reminds us that again the failure of suburbia is in part due to the failure of many developers to accommodate such third places where community can really grow. And if there is anything that the communal movement has to teach the rest of the world, I think it's the importance of allowing for that richness of a diverse and self-contained community so that our home life, our social life, and our work life aren't kept so separate and reliant on the automobile and now the internet for connection, for real connection. Uh, so uh, what, what's the point of all of this kibitzing? How does it become something bigger? How does it affect sustainability? And I think gossip is good or can be good rather than socially corrosive when it helps us tell a story about our community, when it becomes uh, a myth. And I think that's what the kibbutz did well for many years. As the late Henry Neer noted in his history of the movement, quote, the pioneers created a history and a series of legends which gave them strength in the present and confidence in the future. Kibbutzniks gave their communities names, much as eco-villagers and co-housing founders do. They preserved their collective memories and archives and songs, stories, celebrations. They shared a common vision through newspapers, bulletin boards, even closed circuit TV. And these myths sustained the kibbutz movement for 100 years, which is a remarkable achievement. And I think more than ideology, more than an ideology, what suburbia lacks is such a narrative, a defining story. It's let its story be controlled by developers and profiteers who have labeled these subdivisions with green sounding and nature based names and yet have left out the social infrastructure to make the tr suburbs truly sustainable and meaningful places to live. Suburban developers enticed homeowners with the promise of paradise. In fact, one editorial writer for the National Real Estate Journal in 1921 claimed that the Garden of Eden was the first subdivision. Uh, but then developers privatize their profits and, and socialize the risk, leaving municipalities to worry about schools and streets and sewage treatment, leaving citizens in a monocultural landscape that lacked a defining uh, story or a collective purpose. 
Uh, and one way to create a, a, a collective identity for suburbia is through the power of micromedia. And, that is a, and I once lived in a district of Toronto that seemed like an unremarkable corner of the mega city. It was hemmed in by a desert road and a railway track and a subway yard. But the neighbors there turned these geographical constraints to their advantage. They, they christened our neighborhood the Pocket. Uh, a micro-neighborhood that didn't exist on any official map. And then they published a newspaper and later an internet site to share stories about the pocket. Its history, its ecology, its personalities, its ups and downs. The myth of the pocket grew and that myth brought neighbors together. Well, in closing, the, the, the founders of the kibbutz movement believed that utopia could be more than a work of fiction. They dreamed of creating a new society of absolute equality, they even imagined the whole world would become one giant kibbutz living in peace and harmony. That dream obviously hasn't come true. The kibbutz wanted to change the world, instead the world changed the kibbutz. And that tends to be the story of utopia, of most intentional communities. Uh, kibbutz Shamir, where I lived, had been founded by hardcore Romanian socialists. Now it's a privatized subdivision of paper millionaires thanks to a lens factory that was listed on the NASDAQ stock exchange. And yet for all of these changes, I think the kibbutz movement and its architecture of hope can help us evolve suburbia into the greener future that the entire planet needs. And I think the most important lessons are these. I mean, be bold, dream big, give every community a name and a means through which to broadcast its myth to the world. Turn every area of, uh, from a, every neighborhood from an area code into a gathering and build these third places uh, and remove barriers to convincing. I mean, we might not build utopia overnight, but we can cultivate our small good places. Uh, one less fence and one more story at a time. Thank you. And, and I should note, anybody who has their own ideas about how to do this, I am leading a workshop in which you get to do the work and, and share our ideas and build a plan for greening subor suburbia tomorrow. So please sign up for that. Thank you, David, for your very revolutionary uh, uh, presentation and, uh, to change the, land, the, the North American landscape. Uh, suburb is a uh, real challenge. So uh, thank you, members. It's really worth to come here and fly for six, seven hours and go to hear your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so if there are any questions, Okay, so, okay. I, more a, a comment. I think it's very interesting when we look at people or groups of people, when we go to extremes, mm -hmm. at one point, the extremes start to get together or move more towards each other. The kibbutz has moved to actually some of them and they are still in the process, the process hand in hand. Some kibbutzim are starting to, or part of them are starting to look like suburban areas. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, and uh, suburban areas want to be something um, different than suburbia. So I think when we deal with extremes, there is somehow, it's a pendulum. And I think that, that actually, from my point of view, really presents a lot of hope for the kibbutz too. Because I think really, uh, from my point of view, not as a, a kibbutznik, the kibbutz didn't change fast enough or correct enough during the time. So it stayed a little behind. And the result was a very strong uh, reaction that part of it came from the government. We cannot separate it. Mm -hmm. But uh, because actually the kibbutz cannot, what happened in the kibbutz cannot be separated from what happened in Israel in general because there is a very similar mood. Although the kibbutz try to be isolated, but they all, Israel has moved in a similar direction. But uh, somehow you cannot stay in an extreme situation for a long time, and you start uh, the pendulum starts to move and stop somewhere uh, in between. I think. Yeah, I, I've noticed that in, in the, the kibbutz. I think part of the attraction of newcomers coming here is it's it's a better design. Uh, suburb. It's it's becoming suburban, but it's it's different in a lot of ways, and it even has some of the entrenched sharing things like car sharing that a uh, few American suburbs do, do have. So yeah, I completely agree. People are really ready to move into kibbutzim because they can build their own house the way they want it. 
but they can still use some of the benefits of the commonality, sometimes it's education and children education and things like that. Daycare. And it would uh, have. 